It's the world's number one telecom gear supplier and number two smartphone vendor after South Korea's Samsung. Huawei's revenue grew almost 20% in 2018, surpassing $100 billion for the first time. But the Chinese technology company is at the center of the trade war between China and the United States. Huawei is blacklisted by the White House. Huawei is something that's very dangerous. You look at what they've done from a security standpoint, from a military standpoint, it's very dangerous. I'm Kamal Santa Maria in Doha. Why is Huawei regarded as a cybersecurity threat by the United States? And is it an independent company or just an arm of the Chinese government? We find out as Huawei's chief security officer in the United States, Andy Purdy, talks to Al Jazeera. Andy Purdy, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera today. You work for the number one telecoms provider in the world, the number two smartphone provider in the world. And yet, in the research that I did for this interview, I came across a podcast called What's So Scary About Huawei? And I wanted to ask you that. Or maybe I would rephrase it a little bit for you and I would say, what is it that you think makes people, quote unquote, scared of Huawei? Well, I think right now we have a geopolitical battle between the U.S. and China, and as the largest privately owned company in China uh, and active in telecommunications markets in 170 countries, we're kind of caught in the middle. Um, and a number of government people have said it's not really about the company, it's about the country, China. So I think the fact that we're based in China uh, raises some concerns in certainly the U.S. government and some others. Right, so the common misconception is that Huawei is in some way, shape or form, an arm of the Chinese government. So how do you respond to people when they question you that? And I'm going to presume you get that a lot, particularly in the United States. What's a, a response you, you give to them? Well, it's a couple things. First of all, um, the documentation that we've made available to experts to come in uh, to analyze the ownership of the company, uh, it's pretty clear the records are, are, I think, are convincing and powerful evidence. As a former prosecutor, I'm familiar with weighing evidence. Uh, we're a privately owned company. The next issue, though, is the U.S. government is concerned that because we're headquartered in China, the Chinese government can force us to do things. Uh, so that becomes the second question. Can they? Well, the fact is, no. Uh, our founder, Mr. Ren, has indicated he'd close the company before he would succumb to, to that kind of pressure. We have not received that kind of pressure from any government anywhere in the world. And we have measures in place, and we can add additional measures uh, in those places where it's necessary, to provide assurance and transparency that we are not subject to the undue influence of the China government or any other government. When you say Huawei is a privately owned company, can you explain that a little more? Because it's not, it, it, there's a little bit more of a technicality within it in the way that the, the shareholding is done, correct? Well, we have 80 or 90,000 shareholders in China who have an equity interest in the company and they get the vote uh, on the governance group uh, that runs the company. Uh, there is a structure of that governance group, which is a union committee, they call it, uh, which helps uh, in, in the process of leading to the actual selection of the board of directors. So some people are confused or concerned about this union committee. Well, because stating, they would think a union in China. They and st stating incorrectly that there is some connection between that committee and the China government, or stating incorrectly that committee actually runs the company. The company is run by the founders under the supervision of, of the board of directors. Frankly, one of the reasons I was hired by Huawei seven years ago is to help promote stronger cybersecurity and privacy protection. The fact is cybersecurity and privacy is an increasingly important issue both here and, and around the world. And so I'm trying to promote the kinds of measures that are necessary to address cybersecurity risk and privacy protection in a way that provides assurance and transparency. So there's a basis for knowing which products are worthy of trust. The bad guys can hack through everybody's products, everybody's equipment. So we as a global community need uniform standards and conformance programs and independent product testing so we can have trust through verification. Australia. New Zealand, <clears throat> the United States, to a degree the UK and Germany as well. These are all countries who have in one way or another said no to Huawei. And I'm talking about the 5G networks. Wanting or not wanting in this case to have Huawei equipment involved in their 5G uh, rollout whenever it happens. Those are big countries. They're influential and they make a big noise about this sort of thing that, and, and go to the point of, of banning you. Where, where are all these fears coming from then, and how are you not managing to allay them yet? 
Well, first of all, we were only banned in the United States and Australia. We lost a contract in New Zealand. We are not banned in New Zealand. And so you see around the world a, a, a multifaceted campaign by the U.S. government to block Huawei from participating in communication networks. The U.S. government has been remarkably unsuccessful in doing that. For example, two weeks ago, Germany, one of America's closest allies, announced that they've come up with a comprehensive program to address cybersecurity risk that will not ban Huawei from the 5G networks. The European Union is working on a similar approach. That's what we recommend is a comprehensive approach based in internationally recognized standards with conformance programs. That's how you address the risk, particularly given that the sophisticated nation states can hack through anybody's equipment. So is that a model you can take to other countries and say, look, this is what we're doing with Germany, this is how we can cooperate? Well, that's a message we've been taking. The U.S. government started putting extreme pressure on Huawei around the first of the year, and we are seeing a remarkable pushback around the world about the idea that Huawei would be banned without a serious consideration mm. for risk mitigation, the kind of risk mitigation that should apply to all, all countries. So we see a very good receptivity to the message of cybersecurity experts and the global cybersecurity assurance program that we're implementing and the work we do with telecom and mobile operators around the world to help make sure that the shared responsibility in cyberspace is being taken seriously with transparency and providing adequate assurance. Let's go into the U.S. ban in a little bit more depth. Donald Trump's exact words were, Huawei is something that's very dangerous. Look at what they've done from a security standpoint, from a military standpoint, it's very dangerous. That is, in many respects, a typical broad generalization that President Trump likes to use. But still, it's coming from the president. And I think it, it speaks to the, 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 the barriers that are being put up in front of you. Well, right now, in the context of the U.S.-China trade talks, the kinds of conversations with U.S. government officials that we would have, such as when I was in the government at the White House and Department of Homeland Security years ago, they're not willing to talk to us. They're, so the, the context of the U.S. trade talks is impacting everything. And despite the, uh, the strong message from the U.S. government, countries around the world are pushing back and saying, we recognize cybersecurity and privacy risk is important, mm -hmm. and we're gonna use a comprehensive program to address that risk, and we think that's a very good thing. So are they just, do you just feel that they, the United States, have just made up their mind already, and, and hence don't wanna to talk to you? Well, there's no question they, they aren't talking to us. Mm. Um, and you know, as I said, in the normal context, normal times, we would have these conversations. Because you take, for example, Nokia and Ericsson, European-based uh, companies. They have very deep connections to China. So take Nokia, for example. They have a, a joint venture with Shanghai Bell, which is owned by the Chinese government. Dramatic, deep uh, research and development, assembly and manufacturing in China. They're allowed, to, both companies are allowed to do business in the United States mm. because there are government monitored risk mitigation programs that they're governed by. We want to talk with the U.S. government about a similar kind of approach, because if it works for Nokia and Ericsson, it should work for Huawei. You've become the bogeyman then, in, in, in that respect. I'm, I'm using my words carefully about the scary Chinese company, even though, as you're pointing out, Nokia and Ericsson have got ties actually to a Chinese government company, and yet you become almost a scapegoat. Well, as, as, I, as I mentioned, a number of government officials said it's not about the company, it's about the country. The U.S. is deeply concerned about China hmm. and the rise of China economically and militarily. And the U.S. liked the world better when the U.S. was stood alone hmm. as the powerhouse economically and militarily. So these issues about market access, for example, and tariffs, those issues are very important. And so we seem to be use, being used as sort of a bargaining chip in a way as part of those China-U.S. trade talks. And we don't want to be a bargaining chip because the China government doesn't speak for us and we don't want to speak through the Chinese government. So you've mentioned the trade war. In fact, I think that might have been in your very first answer. So I'd like to get your views on that sort of thing, not necessarily just as a Huawei executive, but as a business person watching this so-called trade war between the United States and China. I, I say so-called because well, wars are usually things which are won or lost. And in this case, I don't know if that's actually an accurate description of what's going on. In fact, both sides are possibly losing here. Well, it's like, it's like the race for 5G. It's not a question of winners and losers. So in terms of the, the trade situation, it's really interesting. When you look at Huawei's situation in the U.S., it appears that Huawei is more important to the U.S. than the U.S. is to Huawei, given our global increase in revenues the first three quarters year over year were over 24%. Hmm. What's at stake in the United States? 
130 American companies want to sell to Huawei. $11 billion a year. It's over 40,000 in jobs. So they're putting a hold on the ability of American companies to support 40,000 American jobs when those products have already cleared national security concern? And we sell to the rural customers. We're not really making substantial money. We want to support our suppliers. We want to support our customers. And so the kinds of concerns the U.S. government has, these can be addressed as they are with Nokia and Ericsson. They can be addressed for Huawei. So the whole idea of the trade war and tariffs is, do you think, and I certainly see commentary along these lines, that it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how tariffs actually work and that actually they can hurt your own people, in this case the American tariffs, hurting, hurting the American people. Well, I'm, I'm no expert, and, and the tariffs aren't directly impacting the ability of American companies to, to, to sell to Huawei. But certainly, this is part of a political dynamic mm. that, so bigger fish to fry than just Huawei, that hopefully that some of these issues between China and the U.S. can be worked out, because it's going to affect America and China, it's going to affect the whole world, and we all need to make sure that we can have reasonable economic growth in the Gulf and, and throughout the world. Something that did affect Huawei directly was uh, the issue with uh, Google and Google products no longer being able to be installed and used on, on Huawei phones. Anecdotally, I heard people say that was when they went, wow, this is actually something which does affect me. You know, I'd heard about these problems between China and the US, but if I can't access the Google Play Store on, on a Huawei phone and I can't use Google products on a Huawei phone, then that actually changes things. How are you actually combating that? Are you, are you making any headway there? Well, Google is certainly an important supplier to us. Uh, the Android platform is, is fundamentally open source. Uh, we are going to try to find, we are trying to find alternatives to that platform and the support we get from Google. We'd prefer to, to, to work with Google as the second number two manufacturer in the world behind Samsung. Uh, Samsung and Huawei are major uh, users of the Android platform. We think it's a good platform. We think it provides trust. Um, we're not sure exactly how things are going to work out. Um, but we've sold, we've shipped over 240 million smartphones this year, about a 26% over last year. So while there may be an impact on our growth in revenues, perhaps as much as a $10 billion reduction in growth, mm. we're going to make more money and we're going to do fine. The question of whether the American companies are going to do fine if they can no longer sell to Huawei is another question. How were you able to sell that many phones? Because I think most of the fanfare, rightly or wrongly, goes to a new Apple phone launch or a new Samsung phone launch. We definitely hear about the Huawei ones, but it's not seen almost on the same tier. And yet, as you say, what was the number you just said? 200 240 million this year. How are you doing that? We have very good products. We have very good phones. We have loyal customers. And we have delivered on the innovation that's necessary, the quality and the form factor, the, the artistic nature of the phones, the tremendous cameras. These are things that resonate around the world. I think our users will be able to download Google Apps directly onto the phones, but we want a platform such as Google where the apps are preloaded and that we can share with whoever the supplier is with the revenue so everybody benefits. So your customers don't have a problem with Huawei, clearly. It's governments that have a problem with you. How do you reconcile the two things? How do you, I mean, you, you, you're a huge success on one hand, but battling uh, very publicly on the other hand. Well, but it shows that the, the pushback from countries around the world, with the exceptions of the United States and Australia, demonstrate that it's not all about the U.S. wants something, the U.S. says this is the case, the world's saying, we want to take stock ourselves. You know, we're not looking for anybody to bully us. Um, we want to make sure that we get the best in technology and competition is critically important, whether it's in smartphones, whether it's IT infrastructure, whether it's 5G, IoT, artificial intelligence. So we believe that these kinds of things are resonating and we will find an alternative to the Google Android platform if we have to, but we would rather stick with Google. You used the word bully there and said you don't want to be bullied, fair enough, uh, but there have been incidents, and I bring up, of course, the, the, the founder's daughter, uh, Meng Wangzhou, the CFO of your company, being detained in Canada for, well, that was technically for violating sanctions against Iran. Um, I mean, what sort of chill, I guess, does that send through you and your colleagues as Huawei executives, thinking that you could be picked up at an international airport like that? Well, the, th that issue is, is certainly of great concern. It's very personal with, with, with our founder and mm. others that uh, she, our, our chief financial officer, we're, we're close to. Um, but the fact is, when you look at the larger issue about allegations or, or actually fears that Huawei would do bad things, 
you look and you see the UK and Germany both came out and said, despite the best evidence, the best shot the US government could give, mm. there was no evidence of significant cybersecurity wrongdoing by Huawei. So they're going to continue to consider doing business with us based on the, the actual technical merits and the cybersecurity measures in place. Is there an update on what might happen to her? I believe the extradition is possibly happening in January of next year. Well, as a longtime lawyer, now a recovering lawyer, uh, <laughs> one thing I do know is that the process for extradition in Canada is, is, is huge, very burdensome, and very time consuming. In the end, we have confidence that the judicial systems in Canada, and if she's extradited to the Eastern District of New York, we believe there will be fair conclusions on the legal proceedings, and of course, we hope there's a positive outcome. The business you're in, and in fact, everything we've talked about, and you've brought it up a lot, is security. It's online security, it's everyday security. That is your role, that is your, your, your title, Chief Security Officer. How do you balance the needs then of customers and the security they want, of governments and of working through all the minefields that you've talked about, and then also the fact that you are a business and you've obviously got your own business needs as well. How are you finding the, the task of balancing all of that? Well, it's an exciting process, and I'm, I'm just thrilled to death to be part of it. Every day I wake up looking forward to taking on the challenges. It's really about risk management. That's the concept within cybersecurity, identifying the threats, the vulnerabilities in the systems, and the consequences, the potential impact if, if those are, if, if the threats impact the vulnerabilities. So it's about managing the risk. You can't, nobody can eliminate all risk, but we have to remember that the telecom operators have major responsibility. We're an equipment vendor. People forget that the telecom operators have a critically important role. They've got their standards, their best practices. We, in working with the global community, have standards and best practices to address the risk. So it's about risk management. We believe the world is moving toward a system of internationally recognized standards, conformance programs, and testing of the products of all equipment vendors so we can have a system of trust through verification. We think that's the way that, that citizens and governments can take advantage of the benefits of technology in a way where the risk is addressed. I'm glad you used the word trust because that was going to be my next question. And this is a broader question I'd like to ask you, not necessarily about Huawei itself, but the, the fact that this is all about who we are. It's our data, it's our, it's our money, it's our personal details, and it requires from us, the consumers, a lot of trust of you, the creators of the, of the technology, the telecoms companies. There has to be a lot of trust these days, and people's trust gets shaken when you hear of the, the Cambridge Analytica scandals and things like that. People's trust gets shaken. How do you, again, make sure that people trust you? Well, that's why the following of the standards and best practices, the specific requirements in individual countries or such as in Europe uh, with, with the European Union, having the, the programs in place to provide, as I said, a open uh, system that provides assurance and transparency. So there's an objective basis, there's an evidence basis to know whether the, address, the risk is being addressed, whether it's the telecom or mobile operators or the equipment vendors. That's the message and that's why we work with governments all over the world, to make sure that the requirements make sense, to make sure their conformance programs and the appropriate testing is in place. In the end, do you believe that everything you've told me and what you've been telling other governments and you talk about the pushback from other governments that it can eventually get through to the United States? I take your point that you don't want to make everything about the United States, but it's a big important market and they make a lot of noise about this topic as well. Do you feel that everything that's starting to work with other countries will eventually work there? Well, I certainly think at some point the United States is going to have the comprehensive program in place that they need that they don't have now to make sure they can address the risk from the telecom operators and the equipment vendors. When that time comes, I don't know how soon it will be, we'll be allowed to compete. But the fact is we are succeeding globally despite the fact that we make very little money from the United States. It is the biggest market and we do want to participate and we hope that as a senior UK intelligence officials said, there needs to be a clear-eyed focus on national security, where there are objective requirements and conformance programs. That's what's necessary for everybody to be able to have a level of comfort that they and a basis for trust. So then how do you change the narrative? I know you're not a PR man, you're a security man, you're an executive, but how do you change the narrative? Because that story which is pushed out by the United States, as I said, it's loud and it overrides maybe I mean, I was personally surprised to hear how many phones you're selling. That it gets the, the, the noise drowns that out. 
Well, the voices of experts are coming out. So the European Union just issued a major risk assessment for 5G that goes through the kinds of analysis that's necessary to understand the risk, to understand the threats and the vulnerabilities, and create a system that the risk is managed and have appropriate standards for testing of the products. And Germany just came out with their program for a similar kind of approach. So I'm not saying trust Huawei. I'm not saying trust China. I'm saying don't trust anybody. But let's put the measures in place so that there's an objective and transparent basis for trust. And that's the kind of thing we're working for, and we're seeing some pockets of places around the world that that's bearing fruit. Do you work with other similar companies to, to push that? You say you're trying to uh, push an, an, an open playing field where everyone talks and, and all the information is out there. You want to make it not a Huawei issue. Do you, get, do you get cooperation? Absolutely. And it's not led by us. That's, that, that's the beauty of it. So, for example, the, the 5G standards that are going to create a platform that's going to be more secure than 3G and 4G. So the 3GBP standards, it's a coalition of seven organizations and scores of companies and governments participate in creating those standards after doing uh, threat modeling. The other that the mobile operators and the equipment vendors are working on is called the NESAS, the Network Equipment Security Assurance Scheme. BSI in Germany has studied that scheme. The European Union is considering that scheme. And that's a scheme that provides standards in the mobile industry and testing and certification. So in that sense, it's not about Huawei getting traction. It's moving toward a more secure cyberspace that everyone's going to benefit from. And we're moving in that direction. You know, we're just throwing around the term 5G. I think there might be viewers who don't necessarily understand what a step up it is. If you're talking about 3G to 4G to 5G, it's not just steps like that, is it? It's more like that. Right. And significantly, the community is working together to make sure that 5G will be more secure than 4G developing these standards and, and conformance programs. But 5G is going to enable trillions of dollars in increases in gross domestic product around the world, as it not only does speed, which people focus on, not only about throughput, the amount of data that connects, but it's also about latency, the delay in the signal getting through. So that's what's going to make driverless cars much safer. That's what's going to make remote surgery the kind of thing that you can rely on. And third is multiple connections and lower power consumption devices. That the carbon footprint's going to be significantly reduced by, by the, uh, the, the energy used for the base stations. So that combination is going to help digitize vertical industries and is going to lead to tremendous job growth. So 5G and AI that comes along as well will serve as platform for serving a, a, a humanity and creating additional jobs. So that's why people are so worried about it. If I bring it back to Huawei itself, this is why people, because there is so much potential, there is so much in the future that is clearly going to rely on 5G, and if they don't trust you, and your components are, are going to be used or not be used, that's where the problem's coming from, isn't it? Well, so for example, we have an offering for 5G that is a third-party application to monitor the various security gateways and security uh, mechanisms and to make sure that conformance can be demonstrated with assurance. So a third party provides the basis for trust in that case. And of course, in cooperation with the telecom operators. That kind of measure is what we need more of, and, and we're working toward that. Now, you may have noticed in this interview, I've got an iPad here, <laughs> an Apple product, and your CEO was recently photographed with an iPad as well. I wonder what that says. Is that saying that Huawei executives want to know their competition, that they respect the competition, that they think the competition actually does a better job than them? What do you think? No, it means the company doesn't force even the family of the founder to have only Huawei equipment. Mm. So that the idea that we use bring your own device, I can use a Huawei phone, I can use an Apple phone, I can use a Samsung phone. What do you use? I, I use a Huawei phone, the, the, the uh, P30 Pro, which is probably the best phone on the planet, actually. But you would say that. But then that was part of a, uh, a partnership, right? You partnered up with Leica, which is known yes. as a, you know, I mean, a, thing, uh, well, a very strong uh, camera brand. And partnership for Huawei is what it's all about. It's not getting all the market share. So if we get to compete in the US, we will be part of the radio access network. In the UK, there are multiple providers to help provide uh, resilience and, and to manage risk. And we've got 26 joint innovation centers around the world. It's about partnership. It's going to help the global community prosper iPad is considered an industry standard, I think, for tablets. It's, 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 it's become a byword for it. Do you foresee a day when it's a Huawei product, when they're seen at the same tier as, as an iPad or an iPhone or something similar like that? We're not necessarily concerned about being number one on a particular type of device or, or different kind of function. 
we want to compete globally. We want to partner globally. We want to grow our revenues. Because as an employer at Huawei, we believe in two things fundamentally. We want to be part of something very special, and we are. And we want to really provide wealth for our families. And we're able to do that with Huawei. So you're not concerned about the competition as such, even though you've proven you're up there with them if you're selling that many smartphones every year. What do you want to do next then? Well, I think we're underestimating the importance of competition globally. The importance of competition to drive innovation, to drive greater security enhancements, to provide more information on which to determine whether a product is worthy of trust. Why do you think the China government lets Nokia and Ericsson compete and win contracts in 5G in China against Chinese company? They obviously must believe, and I've never spoken to them, but they obviously must believe that competition is critically important to help keep the prices down, help keep the innovation up, and to help provide additional security and, and resilience in the products. Andy Purdy, Chief Security Officer, Huawei USA, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. We do appreciate it. You're welcome.